Hello. Well. Those of you who are a bit astute will have noticed that the whole time code on the on the camera has a bit earlier than normal. And that's because I've got a oh I must turn my lights on. Everyone else has got their lights on. What rule do you use to turn your light? I bet you drive a really flash automatic car, don't you? That turns that decides for you when the lights should be on. They come on in tunnels and things like that. Okay, well I don't. I don't uh, like most millionaires, I drive an old banger, and uh, that's a. Uh, don't know where I got that from. It's from Secrets of How to Be Wealthy or something. Six Secrets of the Rich and Famous or something. I forget some book I read about 20 years ago, and they said that most people who are really wealthy drive an old banger, and that's because the people who are really wealthy are, uh, and all dentists are really wealthy. All right, don't run away with the idea that I'm a millionaire. The idea is that uh, people who are really wealthy are not, you know, don't win the pools or don't uh, uh, win the roulette or anything. They, um, they basically, they run a, like a local uh, corner supermarket or something, uh, which makes a steady income and they've run it for 20, 30, 40 years and possibly inherited it debt free from their parents or whatever. And, uh, you know, and they've just built up a built up a sizable bunch of money by not spending it, and so they don't feel the need to uh, buy a Jag or whatever. They need something that can go down the wholesalers, <laughs> like a small van. Talking of which, massive news. The car has now passed. 100,000 miles so that happened yesterday I've got a photo of it I'll put the photo in if I can find it Been, uh, it's funny isn't it because obviously that mile is no different from any other mile but it's a milestone that's what it is you see that was when Bitcoin went past a dollar which doesn't make it much difference from when it was 99 cents or a dollar and a cent but it's, uh, they're like, why celebrate? Well, because it's a milestone. And you don't, uh, you don't celebrate every day how much older you're getting, but you do celebrate once a year, don't you? So, because on a particular day, because it's every year that's a milestone. So what you need to do is you need to celebrate the milestones. In the case of age, because you're getting closer, uh, the milestones count down. They don't count. They count up, but they also count down. But the trouble is, you don't know what number they're counting down to, do you? Anyway. Yeah, so, 100,000 miles. I don't think I've ever owned a car that's done 100,000 miles. Especially one that still goes like a rocket, like this one. So, kudos to Peugeot. And, you know, to the general, to the French car manufacturer in general, because when we decided that we weren't going to bother manufacturing cars and we would rather buy Hondas and Suzukis and and uh, Fords, um, the French were like, no, we're going to carry on manufacturing, we're going to subsidise Renault, we're going to subsidise Peugeot, we're going to keep them going. So they got two very distinctive manufacturing companies there that still produce a lot of cars and, you know, are... Uh, ideally suited to Northern Europe and you know I mean if you buy an Alfa Romeo you know what's going to happen don't you because it's been built for the climbs of uh, of Southern Italy and uh, if you buy an electric car like uh, Tesla then again you should know what's going to happen because it's been built for California but uh, no, Peugeot and Renault, I've got to say, are two of the best cars of Renault 5, I think I had, it was the best car I ever had. And uh, this uh, Peugeot partner van, which is ridiculously, is, is just, won't stop, you know, just keeps going. And it's still one of the fastest cars on the run. Uh, 
mainly because the owner's not that worried about the cost of the diesel. But um, anyway, I hope you're well. We, uh, Lou, my nurse and I have um, been doing our accounts because our financial year ended on at the end of September. So we're now in October. The weather's still ridiculously warm. You know, it's 14 degrees, which in the summer is not a bad temperature. <laughs> well, perhaps not overnight. But uh, uh, it's possible, like last year, we'll just have another non-winter, you know. It'll just sort of get a bit... It'll get a bit colder and greyer than normal, and then uh, it'll start warming up again. But uh, here we are, what, the 20-whatever of October, and... Uh, still uh, okay it's raining a lot in Wales and Cornwall got a big wet front streaming up the left hand side of the country but being stuck out in Kent to the in the tiny little bottom right hand corner uh, the other side of London we are we quite frequently get the weather either a day later than everyone else or uh, because the prevailing wind is from the southwest or we get or, or the weather just was up the country if the jet streams to the north of us and uh, we miss it all together so Anyway, so how are you doing? I'm pleased. Uh, we, I'm coming in early because I've got a patient booked in at half past day. We don't normally start till quarter to nine, and in fact, the first patient's not normally booked in till nine. Uh, so the nurses get there uh, half past day, and uh, then they're ready for the first patient at quarter to nine. But then that's very rare you know I, I sort of tend to get there for quarter to nine and so, so they don't book the first patient until nine although we I think we might have to work a bit harder coming up to Christmas because we're taking quite a fair old bit of time off and uh, so three or four weeks so I think we're you know we need to uh, earn the wages by working a bit harder in the first few weeks before we have all this time off I'm having two weeks off in November uh, well Last week in November, first week in December, and then working, I think, for a couple of weeks, and then on the 24th, we're breaking up. The 24th is, I, I, love, I love the 24th of December. That was the day I always used to do my Christmas shopping. There's a bunch of mad blokes who run around every major town centre on December the 24th, in and out of every jewellery shops, uh, just looking for something for their wife, anything, you know. And, uh, I was part of them, and it was quite, you know, the camaraderie was quite high. Uh, it was all, it was the one day of the year when there was nothing but men lined up in the queue, out of the door, in, in every jewellery shop. And if I was a jeweller, I'd have, I'd have just had them all pre-wrapped with a picture of what was in there. So you could have said, right, how much is that? 300 quid, 600 quid, 1200 quid, 900 quid, and, and really just sold it all, you know. But they weren't flexible enough to uh, adapt. So, you know, and sold them with a card as well. <laughs> That's what we wanted. We wanted a pre-packaged service. Uh, there's no, there's nothing that uh, says I love you more than giving someone something you've made yourself. And uh, money is uh, what I make. So that's what I do, just uh, spend it on a present. Anyway, uh, I digress. So we're finishing at uh, lunchtime on the 24th, which I think is fantastic. It really, uh, and then and, and if you're not due back till the new year, although they fixed this yesterday, I had to go through this on red because it was broken. So, uh, yeah, so what we do is we um, don't book anybody in on the morning of the 24th and then basically if anyone has got toothache, they come in and we treat them, usually free of charge. We have a mince pie, we have a glass of Baileys and then uh, we'll give the girls their Christmas presents and then we all go home. Uh, and it's a time for reflection, you know, looking back on the year. I, uh, so when everyone's gone, I sit there with a glass of Baileys in the, and, the, and the practice is completely quiet and, you know, and that's another year, you know, under your belt sort of thing of your life. 
looking back on how that year went. Anyway, part, part of looking back on how that year went was um, looking at how you've done, you know, financially. So the practice has been open. Well, I bought the practice in 20, 2015, November 2015. So the first few years were pretty difficult because the last dentist had, uh, was running it down. You know, he'd, he'd had a massive practice. He sold that. He then worked for a corporate... Uh, for, for uh, Pfizer uh, as, the, as their sort of in-house dentist but kept a few of his patients and then had to relocate to this uh, industrial unit so, so he kept a few of his old patients and a few of his Pfizer patients um, but basically he was um, he's working on the basis that you know that like he had like 50,000 patients and he didn't mind if he lost 49 of them so, and he had lost 49 of them. Uh, in fact, he probably lost 49.7. So, you know, for a long time, uh, we had weeks where we hardly had anybody booked in at all. Now, now we're booked up solid two weeks and it's getting to be a real bit of a problem, you know. Uh, but I'm not gonna take on an associate, I'm not, it's, not, it's just not. I'm not, if I was like, 25 again or 35 again I might but I'm not I'm, I'm nearly 65 so it's just not worth it you know so um, anyway uh, for the for the year to September that, that we've done we haven't actually reconciled the accounts up to the end of September yet I think we've done up to the end of uh, June or July or something so we've made something like £38,000 profit which is you know I mean some years it was a touch and go whether we were going to make a profit at all. Um, but these are the unadjusted figures. I mean, I haven't got a clue what I'm doing, really. I'm using a program called QuickBooks, which is a, you know, it's a sophisticated program, but it's been replaced by an online version, which is a lot less sophisticated, but allows everybody, Uncle Tom Cobbley and all, access to your figures. Um, so it's, it's totally insecure. So I'm not very happy with it at all. It's just not, it's just not. Uh, and it doesn't have the functionality of the desktop version, which has been built up over 20, 30 years. I'm trying to do everything that you can do in C++ with uh, HTML5 or Rust or whatever they use to program it. It just doesn't work, you know. So uh, I'm gonna stick with the desktop version, although it is being discontinued. And the accountant cries like a baby. Every time I send the accounts in, because they're like, oh, you're the only person who uses this. Oh, we don't know what to do. Well, basically what they mean is out of the £6,000 a year they charge me, they can't be asked to buy a copy for 50 quid just so they can they can decode my data file. I don't know what to say, you know. So, anyway, um, one, of the, one of the things we've noticed is, and it's worth passing on because I've discussed this before, is that um, the, uh, our, our uh, new procedure of charging in advance has uh, improved the cash flow to the extent that we are, although we are not, I wouldn't say we are wildly profitable, we have a wild amount of cash coming in. Of course, and this is because, you know, a lot of it, a lot of it, all our treatment that is booked, which is now, I mean, <laughs> uh, okay, I take that back. Having thought about it, people are only required to pay two days in advance. So probably the most that you can say uh, in terms of cash that is brought in is two or three days worth of cash. You know, sometimes if it's a big job, people have paid a week or two early if it's an implant or something. But that's the exception rather than the rule. So in fact, our massive uh, cash surplus is probably not due to the fact that we are invoicing people and asking them to pay two days in advance. It's probably almost certainly to the fact that because they are paying two days in advance and have paid, by the time their appointment is due, 
they are failing much less. So we are getting absolutely zero failures, zero. And by zero failures, I mean zero appointments made where we don't make any money. It doesn't matter whether the patient turns up, they've paid anyway. If they want to not turn up, then that's entirely up to them. And the other day I had a new patient booked in at quarter to nine, nine o'clock or something, paid in advance, didn't turn up. Not worried at all about why they didn't turn up. It could be anything. They pay in advance, I give them the right not to turn up. No questions asked. You know, it could be they decided to do something else that day. It could be they got called into work. Uh, or it could be that they just forgot. They've got the right to do that as well. Anyway, the point is that their chaotic life is not affecting me. So that has been a major success, that policy. Major. And, and you know, if you're worried at all about uh, patients saying, oh, well, you know, this is a bit weird and uh, I, don't, I won't go to a dentist to ask me to pay in advance then the answer is, yeah, well, that's fine. I'm sure there are plenty of dentists who, who don't ask you to pay in advance, and so well, you just need to find one of them, right? And uh, we, we've gone from strength to strength with this policy. Uh, and we're getting booked further and further ahead because, I wouldn't say because of this policy, but, just you know, uh, with this policy having absolutely no effect at all on bookings. And I'll give you a typical example. We have a, a lovely guy... Um, I'll call him John because that's his name and uh, he came in and <clears throat> and he and his partner they're very long-standing um, patients of the practice and and sort of very uh, well liked and uh, you know funny and if we haven't seen them for a while we think oh you know I wonder when they're coming in and um, but because they're long-standing patients of the practice, the, the, his partner said, look, you know, I don't understand this. Why, why are we being asked to pay in advance? And I told them, we always explain to them, and say there's a very high correlation between people who don't pay their invoices and people who don't turn up. Um, so basically it flags up, it's a flag for us, two days in advance, that someone is likely not to come in. And so what happens is that gives us two days to cancel their appointment and book in someone else who's in emergency or off the cancellation shortlist. And as a result, we get zero no-shows and we get uh, maximum efficiency. Oh, he says, okay, that's all right. Now, I understand. Now you've explained it to me, I understand. So, <clears throat> he then, he then failed to turn up for his appointment. And so we did, we just put the uh, the 45 quid he paid in advance down as payment for a no-show, PFA, whatever. And uh, then he rang up and said that he was very sorry, but he had to wait in. Uh, he, he had had to wait in for the doctor, and it had completely slipped his mind. Not that it had, um, not that he'd had to wait in for the doctor because of an emergency, and and therefore something more urgent had come up but just the uh, life events had overtaken him and uh, he'd forgotten so Ellie's very nice and polite about this she said that's fine I'll make you another appointment but I'll have to send you another invoice you know and he's like oh okay you know having had this explained to him you know and then and then realised that he'd done exactly what we said that uh, people were doing and probably in his own mind thought oh well I would never do that and then having done it obviously he was embarrassed you know he was embarrassed but he's made another appointment but he hasn't paid yet but he's not due to pay yet in the meantime his partner uh, having having uh, rescheduled an appointment with, with adequate notice because he came back from a cruise and uh, the cruise line, he said, Cunard had mucked him about um, and got him into the port late and he has to have a life-saving injection because he's had a liver transplant. Um, and then, uh, so he had to cancel my appointment because he had to reschedule his life-saving liver transplant injection, which is fine, as I say, he gave us plenty of notice. 
But then he came in for a checkup and we found out he needed a root filling. So we sent him a we sent him a quote and then um, booked him in and sent him an invoice and he then he then wrote back and said, Look, I'm not paying this invoice because if you know if something comes up then I can't uh, afford to lose that sort of money. It was about five hundred quid for the root filling, plus a few bits and bobs. And um, he said, I can't afford to lose 500 quid if I can't come in. And so we said, well, look, that's, we do understand and sympathise. But basically, I said, if there's a reason why you can't pay just two days in advance, like, for example, you don't get paid until the day of the appointment or the day before the appointment, say, let me know. But there wasn't. I mean, he could have paid. He just didn't. He wanted to take me on, on principle. He wanted to fight and die on this hill of whether or not he should be allowed just to pay on the day and presumably not turn up if something um, came up of a medical nature. Now, just as in so far as he is not able to bear a loss of 500 quid if something comes up of a medical nature that requires urgent attention, I am not also able <laughs> to bear a loss of 500 quid if something comes up in his life of a medical nature and to be quite honest with you I think it's more contingent upon him to bear the loss than me because I bear the loss for everyone you wouldn't believe the excuses that we get for people that don't turn up um, when, you know, and as I say now we don't mind we're like yeah okay really I mean you're welcome to tell us why you didn't come but it's not going to make the slightest bit of difference as to whether you get your money back. You know, I've had people trapped in hotels in Norfolk in the snow and uh, unexpected uh, some some woman who um, fell over and got a black eye and knocked her bridge out and had to go down A&E and then made an appointment to have the bridge re-cemented and then, and then said that A&E rang her literally on the practice doorstep and... Um, told her to come back because they'd seen something on her brain scan and they kept her in overnight and everything and you know people this is life people's lives go on around us but I can't um, in that case obviously we didn't charge her for sticking the bridge in but we did charge her what the cost of the time the checkup would have been if she'd just come in and had a checkup the bridge the bridge charge was just an estimate based on what she told us that she needed. It may be she's cracked the roots and she can't have the bridge re-cemented. In which case we'll either refund it or uh, put it towards the cost of whatever work she does need doing. But you just can't, you just cannot, especially these days, you know, let people's chaotic lives affect your livelihood. And the fact of the matter is that, uh, although I am sorry to say, as far as John is concerned, his appointment was cancelled, and the uh, the waves the waves of patients wanting to book appointments have sort of washed over him, and 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 in so, you know in the same way as the incoming tide washes over a sandcastle, and he is no more. His appointment is no more. The day he was coming in is no more. He is no more. Um, and it's sad because I miss him because he was a nice bloke. But he was like, um, you know, he wanted to offload his risk onto me, and I'm just not prepared to uh, accept it, you know. And so we had to agree to disagree, which is a shame. But then, but that's what you have to do. You you will lose the odd patient through that practice, but it, you know, that that procedure. But it will pay uh, big dividends for you. Uh, so I would, uh, I would still go for it. I still recommend it. Okay, all right, nice to talk to you. I'll talk to you soon. Bye.